Okay, record is on. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar series of the Center of Research, Innovation and Design. And a special welcome to the great architect, Karl Abikaram, our guest for today. So Mr. Karl is an architect and cultural heritage professional, particularly in the fields of interpretation, content, and curatorial development and project coordination and management. He graduated with a Bachelor's of Architecture from the American University in Dubai, in which he received the first place award at the Senior Thesis Showcase and the AIA Design Award for the Best Student Graduation Project in 2014. He also received a Master's in Architecture and Historic Urban Environments at UCL, the Barlett School of Architecture. And he graduated with distinction and went on to complete a Master's in Philosophy and Heritage Studies at the University of Cambridge. With five years of experience in the world of exhibition and museum development, Mr. Carl has participated in creating a variety of projects with companies such as Perkins and Will, Barker and Langham, Asiona Cultural Engineering, and Symmetrical. Some of the projects include Shindaga Museum, Qasr al Hassan, as well as various Dubai Expo 2020 projects, such as Terra, Terra Sustainability Pavilion, Expo Live the Good Place Pavilion, and sev several country pavilions. Mr. Carl's passion lies in the world of classical art and architecture. He co-founded Classical Lebanon, a social media initiative that aims to revive the lost language of classical architecture in Lebanon to counter the ongoing degradation of aesthetics, beauty, and harmony. Before starting our presentation today, I'd like to ask all the attendees to write down any questions or inquiries that they have in the Q&A box or send them privately to me. Mr. Carl, welcome and the floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much for this wonderful introduction and uh, thank you very much to AUD for uh, this opportunity for me to share my passion with everyone here today. And I'm really excited to uh, speak about a rather unconventional path toward becoming or soon to become a classical architect. And I'm going to share my screen. So I've chosen the title Towards Classicism to narrate this journey on how I reached a particular conclusion on why it is important to revive this lost language of classical architecture today. But you may ask, why, why classical architecture? It wasn't a straightforward journey, but rather an experimentation in partaking in different projects and merging two career paths, that of an architect and a cultural heritage curatorial developer. From AUD to UCL and from Cambridge to working for the past five years with various international companies um, around the Gulf region, my mind was in constant dialogue with itself on the idea of tradition, heritage, and where contemporary architecture is taking us in the future, especially its relationship with the past. It was also a very deep and personal relationship I've had with the idea of a ruin, its decay and its beauty for as long as I can remember. The rhetoric we have today particularly with beauty, has always been a controversial one and is almost never discussed. We always say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but when you come to terms with traditional art and architecture, you realize that it is not just a subjective idea anymore, especially when, you, uh, when it's done correctly. It becomes an idea that is grounded in math and neuroscience. You realize that classicism is not a style of the bygone days, but a timeless language that evolves while maintaining harmony. When you think about it, the classicists of ancient Greece produced entirely different works to the classicists of the Renaissance and entirely different works to the classicists of 20th century Ottoman Baroque era. The language is both diverse and yet very comprehensible. It created a very rich repertoire of works for us to find inspiration from and create new classical works of architecture today. It is one of life's greatest misconceptions to disregard the past merely because it is the past. Good ideas, regardless of how old they are, can be timeless and they can be far more advanced to what we create today. We have much to learn from the classical grammar of architecture. When we stop treating classicism like a footnote from history, a world of design opportunities arise. You will see throughout the presentation how my relationship with architecture um, uh, evolved, especially when it comes to tradition, ruins and classicism. And you'll get to see how it morphs in the unlikeliest of places using the unlikeliest of technologies. So please join me in exploring how getting lost in the classical world can help us find and create a beautiful future. So the talk will be divided into five main parts, this inner gut feeling I've always had with classical architecture, 
uh, and ruins. My relationship with ruins as a student, the heritage development years, the museums and exhibitions I've worked on. Classical Lebanon, which is the social initiative that I've co-founded with a good friend of mine, Elias Arayas, to uh, revive this lost language of architecture in Lebanon, and the conclusion. Now, this gut feeling. When we look at old photographs of how cities used to be, particularly the one in Beirut from the 1920s, we can't help but feel the sense of loss, this loss of beauty. And one might say that this is merely nostalgia, nostalgia for a time not lived. But when we really think about it is, it, is it really nostalgia? When we look at public spaces and how they seamlessly integrate nature and architecture together to bring about a real sense of communal belonging, we wonder how, would they, how did they get this sort of design so right using limited technologies uh, that they've had? And when we look at our institutional buildings from the past, like this old police station that was unfortunately demolished in downtown Beirut, why is it that it, it gives us this sense of stability and trust Perhaps it has something to do with the distribution of parts, the Tuscan order. And what about other governmental institutions like the one on the right, unfortunately demolished, and other places of worship? They somehow managed to naturally instill a sense of safety, trust, timelessness, and community. However, when we look at, build at our cities today and we compare what we're building today with the traditional uh, built heritage, you almost feel sorry for the group of buildings that you could see on the bottom right. You feel like we've probably done something wrong. But in reality, I believe that uh, this is due to the abandonment of classical ideals um, in, in the world today. So I think when we study ruins, we, we begin to understand that classicism has can offer a very different past, a different path, excuse me. And there are a few theories as to why many of us gravitate towards its promise for ensuring beauty. Perhaps it has something to do with the way it decays. There is a theory that says that classical buildings over time produces ruins and modern buildings produces rubble. And you know, perhaps this has something to do with concrete and glass and as they do not gracefully age and return to nature. Perhaps it has something to do with proportions and ornamentation. We've all heard the word, the words ornamentation is crime and we willfully accept it. But ornamentation, when it is done right, frees us from the tyranny of function. For if we keep building things purely for function today, what is useful today might become useless tomorrow. But beauty is eternal. The classical world is a language that can be read and it is just waiting for us to rediscover it again. So the idea of the ruin and classical architecture is something that I've constantly battled with. I've never quite understood why we couldn't design in traditional designs or you know, in, in the art and architecture. We're always, we're always told to look towards postmodernism, modernity, parametric solutions to create works of architecture. And for some weird reason, this has never sat well with me and I never understood quite why. I've always been personally drawn to you know, the picturesque streets of Italy, to to the ruins of Baalbek in Lebanon, and even to the ruins of Jazirat al-Hamra in Ras al-Khaimah, which is, to me, one of the most beautiful architectural urban gems out there in the world. There's something honest and humble and beautiful about the ruins there. When you even look at the way the plaster is peeling off the, the walls and you get to see the coral stones, you feel that that sort of work of architecture is somewhat honest. You appreciate its it's in the geniusness behind it, the way they've constructed it. And there is this sort of sense of belonging to this place, even though it is completely abandoned and is, well, fortunately now it is undergoing restoration works. So I knew that when my dissertation time approached and back in 2014, I had to do something with the idea of the ruin. The ruin. And um, one of the most important archeological sites in Dubai is from the Abbasid period in Jumeirah. And, I thought that I had to bring that to light and to honor the period in which it came from. And that period was the golden age of Arabia. It was a time of scientific innovation. So what better way was to create a scientific institute in honor of that legacy? Now, at the time, I was really intrigued by the Canadian War Museum and the way in Ottawa and the way they've portrayed the narrative of war through storytelling, through the creation of these tight spaces reminiscent of trench warfare from World War I. And this idea of creating abstract spaces 
to explain a certain emotion, a certain activity really resonated with me. So what I wanted to do was, unfortunately, I, I probably picked one of the worst plots because of how tight and, and narrow and small the site was, but I wanted to make sure that it was placed at an axis towards the archaeological, you know, the archaeological setting. I just had to do something about it. And what I wanted to do was to create these subterranean spaces where you're overlooking different types of activities, where you feel like sp space and time is converging, and you're witnessing ongoing activities that that is promoting you know, uh, innovation, science, and history. Um, another example of how I've dealt with ruins, um, I felt that perhaps I would take it to another stage. So I end up pursuing a master's in architecture and historic urban environments at UCL. And I was really fascinated by the ancient city of Tyre in Lebanon. Now, just as a background information to the ancient city of Tyre, it's one of the most legendary cities of the classical world. And um, what really put it on, on the map of storytelling and history is, the, is Alexander the Great's conquest of the city of the Tyre. As you can see, this part on the far left used to be an island. What Alexander the Great did was build a natural bridge to attack the city. And over time, this isthmus, this sort of landmass, just gradually became land where people have built upon and, you know, from, you know, from the Romans and up until the modern era. And I thought this was really a, um, a fascinating part of the city of Tyre and how it's changed so dramatically. And what I really appreciate about the city of Tyre is that when you walk through these ruins, you can really immerse yourself in the history of the classical past with the largest hippodrome, I believe the most intact uh, uh, hippodrome in the world and the other ruins with the gymnasium. But despite venturing through these classic sites, I've always felt like I was taken out of this immersive experience of being surrounded by history when I just see all these sort of concrete modern blocks within the archaeological site. Something about it really, really takes me out of that experience. And I thought if I was supposed to design a museum or a cultural heritage center that honored uh, the city of Tyre, I had to come up with a, a radical progressive way to design something. Now, when I've studied the ruin, I, I really appreciate the authenticity of the ruin when it's completely overtaken by nature. I wasn't a fan of the way we sanitize ruins, we close it off, we put it around, you know, we fence it off. And I really feel that takes away a lot of its authenticity. And at the same time, I, I was questioning the sort of the star architect intervention of you know, just inserting uh, new ideas that one could argue contradicts with the initial design of the ruin. Now, of course, if I wanted to do the sort of Piranesi style of ruin, I would just not build anything. I would just leave it as it is. So the idea was to create this architecture approach whereby you don't really need an architect or an archeologist to determine and curate the museum. Whatever is discovered, is sort of left in place to ensure the authenticity of the ruin and to avoid any of the political implications that might come about with curation, because you know everything might be interpreted as political. Why would you display a certain object in this room? Why is it the first thing that you see in that? Why is it, you know, why would you put that in that certain place? Why are you emphasizing a certain culture over the other? So the idea of architecture is just to leave everything in place, whereby the ruins itself are left. We end up creating new ruins that are authentic. And the only architectural intervention are cast in place vaults to sort of just keep the work of the archeologists in place. So you end up creating, so it's not the architect or the archeologist or the museum creator that determines the space of the museum, but it's history that determines where you visit and where you go. Everything is left in its place, even the, um, even the art, artifacts, um, I had this crazy idea just to sort of leave the architect, uh, the artifacts in its stratigraphic layer. So I really created, wanted to create sort of this Piranesi effect of nostalgia and this brooding atmosphere of history left on its own. And you're just there to sort of marvel at, at what's left behind. And this is just a sectional study of how minimal the intervention of the architecture is to respect the classical past and to respect the ruins above. So you're not taken out of that experience more so than there already is with all of the modern construction that's going on. So the idea is that you have this sort of catacomb of different spaces. And the only thing that's sort of sticking out are these vaulted structures to sort of really keep that authenticity alive. 
Now after, so I was really quite proud with, of architecture. Um, it received a distinction and in many ways helped me towards uh, going to the University of Cambridge where I pursued a second master's um, in heritage studies. Now with, with heritage studies, what I think is quite important is that they really teach us about um, the, not just the political implications of museums and uh, the troubled histories of preserving one past over the other. There was really a, a great insight into the technical know-how on how to manage a museum, how to curate. And I found that very helpful as an architect because most curatorial developers um, don't have an architectural background where they're able to sketch out their ideas in terms of storytelling because the role of the curatorial developer is to narrate, to help to tell the story to visitors. They get to decide what object goes where, whether we do it with a panel, with an audiovisual experience, with an installation. So with an architectural profession as a background, complementing the curatorial development part, I think that really, really did help me out in the uh, projects I've worked on. For example, with the Shindaka Museums, now this is not a particular project I've worked on because it's not open yet to the public, but it's similar to this one. What I really appreciated about what Dubai has done was they've revitalized Shindaka by adaptively, adaptively reusing all of these old buildings, uh, which were historically used as residences, to tell a story about perhaps shipbuilding or the way life was in the pre-oil days. So I really did appreciate that merging of, of contemporary design and sort of the traditional past of the UAE. And what I really liked about the other project I've worked on, another project I'm quite proud of is Qasr al Hassan which is the, one of the most important national landmarks in the country. Uh, what I really liked about it, I was sort of tasked to, um, to narrate the story, the archeological and, and the architectural story of the, of the castle. So if you come across a certain feature, you'd read about it. And what I want to just point your attention towards something is that when you look at the, the bottom right um, of the table, you can tell that they've done that to expose the coral stones again, which sort of brought back in mind what I've had about how I really appreciate the honesty of the materials. Like, and I start to wonder, will we ever do that one day with concrete and rebar? Would we remove cladding or glass just to show that? I don't, I don't think we would because there is something quite beautiful about natural materials and traditional uses of architecture that we seem to have lost today. And for the past two years or uh, and a half, I've been working uh, with companies like Exion and Symmetrico to develop various exhibitions, quite futuristic and away from classicism, but it has taught, it did teach me a lot about curation and content development. One of the main projects I've worked on was the Terra Sustainability Pavilion as a curatorial developer, working with producers and exhibition designers to create the uh, installations and interactives that you see inside today. The other one is also the Expo Live. I've helped to, I've co-curated and co-developed with a group of curators um, to tell the story of entrepreneurs around the world. So that was also a fun project. But what brings me back to classicism and the way we tell our stories about our traditional past is when you look at country pavilions around the thematic district, um, I've worked on about 10 small country pavilions and I've noticed a common theme throughout them is that in order to attract investment, they first talk about the beauty of their country, their classical past, their traditional past. So it's kind of interesting to see that we're not really promoting the continuation of traditional arts. We just somehow only use what we've been given from the past to, to just market. And I, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen a lot of um, institutions in the, in the past couple of years until recently, I would say that sort of promote traditional arts, the continuation of their legacy to create more of that beauty that I was talking about. It's always, here's some UNESCO, excuse me, UNESCO World Heritage Sites and come in, come, in and, uh, come and invest, but nothing about let's continue that traditional legacy. So, over, over the past few years with Elias Arayas, the, my friend who co-founded Classical Lebanon with, we just decided that, you know, that's it. We just need to revive the classical language of architecture. And we were really happy to find an online community of aspiring new classicists. We were very, you know, during the pandemic, um, the Institute of Classical Art and Architecture uh, decided to go online and they've done a lot of Zoom lectures. So that helped everything is on archive.org, the, the old books from the past. So 
we realize that actually there is a counter movement of classicists going about reviving this lost heritage. And Elias and I thought, what better way to contribute to this uh, development than studying our own ruins that we have back home in Lebanon and trying to come up with contextual designs. Now, before I discuss what classical Lebanon is, I just like to give a quick sort of crash course as to what is classical architecture, just to avoid some misconceptions. So as we know, classical architecture is rooted in the temple architecture of Greece and in the sort of the civic military architecture of the Romans. It's these are buildings that are derived from decorative elements um, indirectly or directly from the vocabulary of the ancient world, especially the five standard varieties, the Doric, the, you know, the Ionic and the Corinthian, as well as its respective standard of moldings. Now, upon first notice, we tend to think that these are just purely ornamentations, but it's not. These are actually grounded in math. So as you can see here with just a single art architect's interpretation from, I believe, the late 1700s, early 1800s, Sir William Chambers, you can tell that, that everything is done, everything is distributed in terms of size based on the, the, the module. The module is that unit of measurement that helps us to determine the size of the classical building. So the module is usually the, the shaft of the lower part of the column. And it's not a very fixed idea. Every architect from the past has had their own interpretation of the Corinthian order, for example, from Vitruvius to Serio all the way to Gibbs, it fluctuates between nine to 10 uh, modules. So it's quite interesting that each one has their, they, they have their own interpretation of what is harmonious. And this is all grounded and based on their study of ruins, for example. And now with classical architecture, it's very difficult to you know, define its essence is its essence from the ornamentations or is it from the golden proportions? But these proportions, for example, can be used to create beautiful contemporary works of architecture. I think the best way to sort of describe it is through the 10 timeless canons, which I will skim through quickly. It's, there's an emphasis on symmetry, anthropomorphism, the, you know, the relation, well, the classical orders are based on the, the human bodies. Um, you know, clear and simple geometry, for example, we tend to think that even Baroque architecture is an overly complicated um, work of a uh, compositional work, but in reality, it's all grounded. It's all based on the humble square and circle, defined spaces, even outdoor spaces need to mimic outdoor rooms and the juxtaposition of discrete forms, this idea where solid spaces all relate to uh, one another. There's all a relationship between them an emphasis on center corners and sides. I can't stress how important this is. Um, one of the most exciting parts personally of, on, about classical architecture is the way they treat the corner. Um, the way pilasters or columns are interlocked with one another to just create this beautiful transition from one facade to the other or from one interior wall to the other. Um, I encourage everyone to look at, at the corners mostly just to see how the architect has uh, you know, provided solutions to create that seamless design. And of course, there is a limited inventory of parts. I think this is where that misconception happens, where classical architecture is thought to be a copy-paste job because of just a limited set of orders. But it is within these limited sets that creates limitless possibilities. And if you are informed enough on these inventory of parts, and the proportions behind it, you can mix and match them. Now, of course, that could put you in the camp of classical illiteracy, or something super edgy and super creative. So classical architecture has that going for it, which I think is fascinating. Again, with inherent formal hierarchies, um, sort of conservative thinkers of classical architecture believe you start with the Doric, the Ionic, and the Corinthian. There is a hierarchy that you can't break. But of course, architects have broken that, like Baroque architects, and have produced fabulous works of architecture. There is a sense of regularity with uh, classical architecture where you're able to identify reoccurring patterns and understand what is its function. And of course, the rule of three, the tripartite division. Now with Classical Lebanon, it is a social media initiative I've co-founded with my friend Elias back in January, 2020, and sort of became a, an accidental pandemic project. We, I, we haven't seen each other in four years, but we're constantly working on Zoom all the time to create content, to design things, to discuss ruins, what makes ruins classical Roman ruins in Lebanon quite unique and how to go about them to create new contextual works. So the idea was we've noticed that there was this, there's this sort of ongoing degradation of aesthetics 
of um, the loss of built heritage. And we feel that the best way to counter this is to study what was given to us from history and create things that uphold those traditions of beauty, uh, traditional ideals of beauty today. And when you really study and dissect Roman ruins, it really becomes a piece of poetry, a piece of literature. You can actually read it. And when you dissect it enough, its hidden grammar begins to emerge. And I really think what brought the former territories of the Western Roman Empire out of the Dark Age was this humanistic um, love for the classical past. This idea where they finally realized um, what, what their you know, what their, uh, what their past has left behind. And you have these wonderful sketches from the 1500s where they are completely amazed by what they have. And they've decided that like, we need to sort of re just recontinue this language once again. And you can see this with the even with the works of Andrea Palladio. Andrea Palladio, for example, created the four books in architecture, his interpretation of the orders and gives exact details on how to draw every aspect of the order to get something that's quite proportioned and harmonious, but he couldn't have done that without studying the past. And that's the beauty of it. And I think when you look at the Renaissance and, and the way they've appreciated the Roman ruins around them, you know, that it got Elias and I thinking that, you know, we have to do the same thing with Lebanon. I think, you know, and, and I think it really needs that sort of revival of beauty. And it's quite unfortunate that Lebanon, just given that, you know, it's quite a very small country, but it has over 58 uh, classical sites of varying scales, and most of them are in great, great condition. And unfortunately, they've always, well, not unfortunately, well, they've always been studied with the lens of an archaeologist and never with the lens of a classical or an actual, just an architect. So what we wanted to do was just get to work and we started measuring. And during the pandemic, right before curfew happens, we're always uh, well, we're always out there just trying to get things measured properly. And right before curfew happens, we'll just go back and talk on Zoom about what we found. So we really wanted to study what we have left in Lebanon and create these new works of architecture. So the idea, as I've mentioned before, um, about studying its hidden grammar. Now, of course, we can create aesthetic posts, um, get a lot of likes or, you know, a lot of views. Like, for, the, for example, this one in the middle in particular, we were really surprised that it, it had almost 25,000 views. We were really surprised. And the purpose wasn't just to create aesthetic posts, but to understand what are the hidden geometries and regulating lines that help to create this sort of building, you know, the, this sort of work of architecture. You realize that nothing is ever done by accident. Nothing is ever like a, a paint thrown on a canvas. Nothing's ever done on a whim. There's always a calculated thought behind every design. And I really think this is important to constantly revisit and not treat history as a footnote, as I've mentioned before, because when you look at uh, sort of, especially when you read Rudolf Wittkauer's uh, architectural principles in the age of humanism, you really begin to see that Renaissance architects did everything they could to ensure that every detail or every distribution of an architectural feature is related to one another. They're all being regulated, these regulating lines. Even Corbusier, you know, the modern architect used regulating lines and appreciated classicism to create his own works of architecture. And I think in many ways, what made Corbusier a successful modern architect is because he was a, a successful classical architect. And I don't think this can happen vice versa. It's, I think if you just start out with modernism, you can't become a classical architect. But if you start out with classical architect architecture, you're equipped with a lot of tools and knowledge to create actually great works of modern architecture. So one of the one of the uh, so when you look, for example, at the amphitheater of Byblos, for example, in Lebanon, um, you realize that even this small amphitheater, nothing was designed by accident. And the beauty of classicism is that you can be, you can actually deconstruct. I know the word deconstruct tends to be thrown around quite a lot, but when you deconstruct, deregulate all these lines, you can actually trace the architectural thought process of the architect, the inscribed circle within uh, the square. It becomes extremely fascinating that you can even replicate that and go in different directions to see what other works of architecture you can come up with, with that architecture, uh, with understanding what that mindset was in the past. And this is what I want to stress 
that's really important with classical architecture. You can either create literate works of architecture or illiterate works of architecture. And I know the word illiteracy is harsh, but in many ways, I think classicism needs to be protected and there needs to be an ongoing critique of what we produce today, because I think one of the misconceptions and, and criticism that classical architecture gets is, oh, look what you're producing today. Like when you take a look at the bottom three examples, which were produced in the past uh, 10 years, you can tell that somehow something is wrong. It, it doesn't work well. It doesn't sit with you well. And you look at the buildings on the top, for example, these were all built in the past five years, but they command a sense of respect, beauty. You can't, you can't question its beauty almost, but when you look at the bottom, you know something is wrong. And I think we feel that something is wrong because in, re in reality, classical architecture is a reflection of who we are as people, our proportions, our ideals. So perhaps because classical architecture is a humanized style of design, we can easily feel that something is wrong, something is, is awkward. And you know, it's quite a pity that classical illiteracy, for example, in the bottom, on the bottom uh, examples, it's not just, it's not just a, a North American problem. These are North American examples. It's a problem worldwide. Even when you drive around in around the Middle East, whether it's Lebanon or even in, in Dubai, and you see attempted classical works of architecture, unfortunately, they tend to be examples that relate to the bottom ones. And it's a pity because you do see this need for classicism. Uh, people do appreciate it, but unfortunately, there's a lot of architects who are not equipped with the right knowledge to design it. So we end up getting things like that on the on the bottom. Now, the idea with these proportions I've mentioned and the three TCs, these sort of cookbooks of architecture that helps you trace the steps to understand how to design the orders and lay out the composition. This is a perfect opportunity for parametric design. When we think of grasshopper, we tend to think of you know, Zaha Hadid, uh, you know, beautiful works of organic architecture, things that are reminiscent of sci-fi movies. But in reality, you can actually parametric, parametrically code and catalog classical orders and manipulate them to stay harmonious depending on the composition. For example, as part of classical Lebanon's um, goal, we, we are studying everything from, you know, James Gibbs, uh, uh, proportions to palladium proportions, reading their steps and doing a computational uh, output and setting parameters so that we can easily just get the hard work done so that by the time we want to create a composition with a few clicks of the button, we can change the design, the spacing of the columns, um, how many engaged columns we want. And I think that's that that helps us to become classicists of our time is because we're taking advantage of this unlike this the unlikeliest of all technologies because we tend to assume that parametric architecture is just for organic shapes but because classical architecture is a math there's a world of opportunity to to use here so it's always this ongoing dialogue between Elias and I for example we've cataloged Palladio we're cataloging some Roman ruins and we start to compare their qualities and how would they look like if we designed a square mausoleum with a certain distribution of parts and anytime we want to change the composition the because we've coded everything in a parametric way everything stays harmonious with the golden proportional rules and some of the rules that palladio has set and what makes this a very interesting um an interesting uh exercise in parametric coding is when when you are when you are recording Palladian, uh, for example, Palladian details of the Doric order, perhaps you might want to be crazy and switch it with an Ionic capital from ancient Greece, but with a, a Doric shaft from Palladio's um, uh, treatise. Now that's a risk, you know, you could be called, you could be accused for attempting class classical illiteracy or a classical violation, but if the, but the parametric solution behind it can help you avoid these criticisms because everything ensures that it has to stay within a certain scale and maintain these golden proportions and this harmonious distribution of parts. For example, uh, another example uh, that's quite famous in Syria and Apamea is the spiral fluting. So what we've done is we've measured based on multiple photographs, the different spiral fluting and ensured its accuracy. And we've coded that parametri parametrically to a point where perhaps one day we might have a client who just wants a uh, uh, a, a Doric house, for example, but is just fascinated by the fluting. So we'll take those, those fluting details 
and adjust it based on classical proportions to fit with the Doric order instead instead of the Corinthian. So Grasshopper is is truly a remarkable tool for us to use because we just skip all of that hard work of redrawing, recalculating. All of that hard work is done initially, and then uh, we can just uh, design based on compositions and see how we can apply these orders with with relative ease. And even when it comes to the minute details, like the volutes of the ionic. Now, when you look at how to design or build an ionic capital on 3D, it tends to be someone just using a 3D program with a, with a print and just tracing. Uh, because, because we want to be proper classical architects, we do everything step by step, as you can see with all these different regulating lines to get that spiral done so accurately. We even code that so that we can change the amount of spirals that going, that's going on, multiple spirals, to create something that is truly harmonious and proportional. Um, so that it really respects that tradition rather than just copy pasting. We're actually parametrically coding the spiral itself. Now, the beauty with the Roman ruins, I would say, in, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Turkey, in, in Egypt, is that it really is a combination between sort of these Semitic Phoenician influences and the Greco-Roman world. Like you can see here, for example, the Phoenicians were masters at taking the best artistic qualities of, of the ancient world and merging them into a single product. Like you get an Egyptian style sarcophagus with a Hellenistic face. These are, this is a, a purely a Phoenician interpretation and that's even uh, reflected in its classical architecture. So there's a project that we're working on right now and we're hopefully going to get it published very soon. And um, so there's about 150 years worth of scholar, scholarly work on the altar of Meshna. And the beauty of Meshna is that it is a Roman adaptive reuse of a Phoenician altar. And scholars have always passed by it and criticized it for being a poor classical work, poor craftsmanship, uh, illiterate. You know, this is apparently supposed to be a Corinthian column, but it awkwardly looks like a Doric one, like what's going on here. So Elias and I began a very deep investigation over the past year, um, visiting the site, measuring the ruins, because there's a beautiful story behind it. There, um, uh, there, there, uh, the worship of Adonis is quite an important thing back in the classical past in Lebanon. Adonis, as we know, uh, was killed by a boar. Uh, uh, because of a jealous uh, goddess lover, because he didn't choose he didn't choose her love over over another one. So a boar was sent out to kill Adonis. And for some for some strange reason, there's lots of Roman altars and temples dedicated to his story. And you see that even in the engraving of stones around the altar. But what fascinated us the most is this sort of Egyptian Phoenician moldings from the Phoenician altar with the classical details. And we were just so curious to understand what was the architect thinking when giving that Roman dress? So, and why were some parts left unfinished while others were perfected beautifully? We've come up with our own theory. We've, we, this is just one of the few diagrams to show you like how much architectural analysis we've done to sort of disprove all of the past um, analysis. We've done things even in a parametric way. We've even understood by doing sort of this regulating line and deconstructing and, and exploring different paths, we were able to, um, to conclude what went wrong at which building phase of the project. And because, you know, as classical architects, we wanted to experiment with this sort of Phoenician classical style of altar, we started thinking, what if Meshna had a bigger budget? How would they have designed it in a different way? So Elias and I like to sort of have little design charrettes on Zoom explaining if I was a Roman architect in the past, what would I have done? If I was, uh, if I wanted to build a mansion with a garden folly in a classical style, how would I honor Mashna? So we do a lot of these design charrettes with like, you know, local styles like the Syrian arch pediment, honoring, you know, Adonis and like just creating these garden follies, having two, you know, sort of these skinny pediments like you could see with the, the temple of Palmyra. So we're really trying to combine Eastern classicism with Western classicism, because it was done like it was done so in the past, and we want to sort of continue that tradition. So these are just screenshots from Zoom of us just constantly working together. And one of the design charrettes that we've published on Classical Lebanon on our Instagram page was um, a building in honor of Saint Barbara. So just to give a step back before we talk about design, we'll talk a bit about the logo. 
So when we when designing the logo for classical Lebanon, we thought to ourselves, how are we going to illustrate and and show the world Lebanon's classical legacy with a with a single logo? And what better way is to to honor or to show or to sort of design something based on Saint Barbara? Now Saint Barbara, what's great about Saint Barbara's story is uh, she was a saint from Lebanon in Baalbek in the late Roman period and. Her story combines the Phoenician, the classical, and the biblical past of the country. So when, when she converted to Christianity, um, her, her father locked her up in a tower, which is why she's always seen holding a tower in Byzantine iconography in Lebanon. And, the, and because she was from Baalbek, uh, after, the empire, after the empire converted to Christianity, they used the Temple of Venus, which is this amazing proto-Baroque architecture uh, in Baalbek, they've used the Temple of Venus and reconverted it later to um, to to honor her. This horseshoe-shaped uh, arch. Now the mask is 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 given to her because um, when she escaped her father's persecution, it was during a Phoenician pagan festival where everyone was wearing a mask. This is sort of our version of Halloween that we celebrate as well. She wore a, she wore a, a a mask to escape. So what we did was given gave, gave her a very Phoenician esque mask with the horseshoe shape art so we wanted to really you know tick all these three boxes and at the time when her name day uh came about we thought let's let's give a classical interpretation to this byzantine icon that we have in beirut and there's a lot of things that are going on there that could be an excellent exercise for classical architecture at the time we were really inspired by james gibbs an english architect from the late 1700s um, at one point, we found it easier to understand, like you know, uh, his like his proportions and his rules and the mathematics behind it. We felt it was easier to code, um, and we came across this beautiful, beautiful World War One version. Well, I think post World War One version of this his book, because after the destruction of World War One, they printed pocket sized books for architects to consult to create beautiful works of architecture because everything's destroyed, so things have to be constructed in a very fast pace. So we really we were really inspired by English proportions at one point. And what we started to do was um, we wanted to design a mausoleum, a sort of a capriccio architectural fantasy of her mausoleum, what her mausoleum would have looked like in the eyes of a new classical architect. So we began to parametrically code the, the um, proportions of James Gibbs using English proportions on a Roman temple from Baalbek, the horseshoe. So we gave we gave that circular tower the horseshoe uh, uh, approach. And what we end up doing was we created in just I think about it was a two day design charrette. Uh, of course, the entablature is unfinished, the dome is unfinished, but it just goes to show you what coding and parametric solutions can do uh, when it comes to you know designing something in a classical work of architecture. James Gibbs, for example, never gave any instructions on the fluting or the bare the bare emphasis part, you know, the shaft. Because of parametric design solutions, anything we manipulate, everything else changes to in order to fit within that scale. So it was just a fun exercise exercise that sort of forced us to sort of design something on a short notice so that we could have a post for her name day in classical Lebanon. So it was a bit of a fun exercise, and. With classical architecture, I, I believe that with the rise of classicism and um, a clear interest in reviving its art, it's, it's really great to see that it's, it's having a new lease on life because we have so much, I would say, so much traditional beauty in our region, especially, I would say, with the Roman ruins in Lebanon. And they can, play a, uh, they can definitely play a part in, in instilling a sense of appreciation for the traditional past and also using the proportions to understand how to design better. because if the, I really believe that there, these timeless works of architecture has the power to create a sense of beauty, a sense of belonging. And when you see, like, for example, the Temple of Venus um, in Baalbek, you know, the design inspiration we had for the uh, St. Barbara's Tower, even the Temple of Venus had, had the power to inspire architects all the way from England to build these sort of garden follies. And you can tell by these two designs, they're completely different to the Temple of Venus as an actual design, but they take inspiration from it and still maintain proportions and harmony. So the limit, the creative possibilities are limitless. And, and I think that's really, really fascinating when you have classical architecture, which is essentially a language. And there's quite a lot in, in Lebanon from monumental um, 
temples to study from. And I really think that perhaps we might not go back to a tranquil time where everything is sort of natural and, and um, slightly emptier. But I do think that there's a lot to learn from the past to create things that are meaningful and beautiful, whether you're a modern, postmodern contemporary architect or a new classical architect, because essentially when you study classicism, you understand that when you build it something that's ideal, it's supposed to reflect the ideal person. And it helps us to instill a sense of calm and dignity and harmony and makes us better people essentially. And I really think personally that we shouldn't be using a modern lens to view the classical past. And I think that's the problem that gave classicism such a bad reputation nowadays. And I think the reason why classicism, I, I mean, it's a conversation for another day. I, I think it's quite a pity classicism disappeared from academic and professional circles over the past 70 years. But I really think that in order to build a beautiful future, instead of using that modern lens to view the past, I think we should use the, the lens of the Renaissance to view our future so that we can create beautiful works for tomorrow. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carl, for a very enlightening presentation. If you may allow me, I'd like to read a few comments and uh, ask a few questions from our students and professors. So Carl, professor maybe, maybe please ask you to unshare the screen. Please. Yes, of course, of course, there we go. Uh, Professor Dina Fawr says that it was a very insightful approach and impressive efforts. Thank you, Mr. Carl. You give us hope that our heritage can remain relevant and effective. So to begin with the questions, one of the questions says, tell us one of the challenging aspects in your journey that relates to classism and how did you resolve that? I think one of, I think the most, the challenging aspect is the, the negative reputation that classicism has among architects today. Um, when you talk about classical architecture, you're sort of immediately shut down. Um, and I've noticed that this is something that has, that doesn't just occur, let's say, I, it occurs everywhere in the world. This is something even my colleagues who are new classicists had experienced. People don't give them the light of day. And we have to rely on a lot of self-education going through abooks.com and secondhand booksellers like the books I have in the back to sort of just study on our own. So there, we don't have any, I wouldn't say we don't have any sort of direct access to new classical mentors. So I think that's the hardest part is that the, the process is, is a lot, takes a lot more time than, than the usual. Thank you. Um, the second question would be, what do you think we need to do in order to motivate future generations to look again at the past? I think in, in many ways, as I've mentioned before, we shouldn't treat classicism like a footnote in history. I think we should encourage uh, more lectures on how to dissect great works of classical architecture, understand its regulating lines and its composition, because by studying them, we get to really appreciate on how they came to be. And perhaps it can even inspire you to create either new classical works of architecture or um, or modern ones. So I think we definitely need to encourage um, going out to classical sites, measuring Roman ruins, and definitely just giving them a bit more attention and just understanding how they actually have an impact on how we design today. Thank you very much. If there are no any other questions, then that would be it. Uh, I have maybe one question for Carl. So Carl, first, thank you so much for today and the informative and actually inspirational talk. Uh, you know, you made us love the past again. Uh, uh, I would like to ask you, um, so what is next? What do you think that what you're doing, what is the next move? What is the next thing that you want to do based on what you're doing? You know, that's that's really a good question. I mean, on, on the next, our, my, well, personally, my next move is that... Um, it's just continuing, just continuing my education, the self-education. I think there's no other choice but just to keep on learning. Um, I'll be going to the Engelsberg Summer School in Classical Architecture in Sweden, which is basically an intensive one-month workshop on classical architecture. Uh, they've created this amazing um, workshop where they've gathered all the new classical architectural firms, you know, the, the practitioners, to help to teach uh, classical architecture to students. So I'll be doing that next next year but I think my, my what I will just keep on doing with Elias is just keep on designing and uh, posting content on on classical Lebanon on our Instagram page 
because I think that at this point, it's just a self-education journey just to share this journey. And perhaps one day we can only convince people, not just by our words, but by just building something maybe one day in the future and just showing that it can be done contrary to popular belief and that we shouldn't shy away from calling something perhaps beautiful or and we shouldn't shy away from promoting traditional arts. So it's just self-education, continuous, yeah, just continuing self-education. Uh, I mean, I, I have to comment on something that, that uh, the way you try to link the past with the future using, you know, uh, um, the order and the proportion and encoding them using the parametric, I think that's a fantastic move. And, and I would definitely commend you on that and definitely encourage you to keep doing that because I think you can in the future create something very special by combining these two elements. So well done with that and please keep, keep, keep up the good work. No, thank you. I think this is one of the, the I would say one of the uh, great thing about classical Lebanon is that Elias and I, our skills really complement each other. So he's he focuses a lot on computation and robotics, and he also has a strong love for classicism. So when we combine the curatorial side of things, research and parametric side of things, I think it's 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 a great way to complement those things. So uh, I'm really happy that we've experimented with that, and I think it's uh, also thanks to Elias's in-depth knowledge with the parametric solutions. Um, Mr. Carl, there is another question asking, how did you find studying at Cambridge compared with other degrees that you have? That's a good question. Um, the University of Cambridge is an experience on its own, I would say, and it's quite incomparable simply because of, I would say, the setting. You are literally studying in a university with buildings that date back to the medieval period. So the, the, the atmosphere is unrivaled, I would say. But in terms of the degree i mean i did get a great quality education but i would say i didn't feel that there was um, quite much of a difference than with aud what i would say that i really appreciate with aud first and foremost is the the level of care and attentiveness they have towards the students when you when you go to bigger universities and older universities um you really start to appreciate the relationships you've had with professors in aud because it feels like a small family so you get you 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 definitely have a lot of more one on one on one. A kid where AUD I would say doesn't meet. I, I mean it's it's a relatively new university and and it's okay. It doesn't. It's fine. I think each one has their own strengths and uh, at the end of the day. But uh, if anyone's studying in AUD, make sure you just appreciate every moment you have. I would say that for sure. Um, another comment from Professor Jose is, uh, we join the words of George. Congratulations on the fascinating use of parametric design. It's a fantastic example of how to use current pioneering tools to understand the past and show new interpretations and discoveries. Thank you very much, Mr. Carl. Thank that would be it. Thank you. Thank you all for this opportunity again. Thank you. Thank you, Carl.